Thank you all for joining us today. Welcome to uh, another uh, timely topic, I think, for many of our small businesses, both, of course, in the Research Park at Enterprise Works and around the community. Um, we are very lucky to have uh, Don Elmore with us today as the director of the Illinois Small Business Development Center at Champaign County EDC to walk us through this program as if any of you out there, and maybe we can have some discussion in the chat, but um, may have participated in PPP as it's now known, I guess, as 1.0. We did a lot of uh, education and, um, and, and helped uh, around that topic. That was probably what now, I think, May, April, May timeframe, Don. So now we yeah. have another round of this, but of course the parameters have changed and some of the uh, qualifications have changed, so it's a really timely topic. Don, as I mentioned earlier, if you were with us, Don does uh, these webinars um, frequently, uh, and so we wanted to bring him in to do something a little bit more targeted towards our audience today, but um, if you do need more assistance, he is a great resource, and feel free to reach out. So without further ado, I will turn it over to you, Don. Thank you so much again for being with us today. All right, thanks, Laura. And I'm going to turn my video off in a minute since it looked like I'm broadcasting out of a cave. It's actually really sunny coming in my window, but that uh, makes it dark here. So I'm going to turn that off. Um, so welcome, everybody. Um, you should see my screen here. We were just discussing the, uh, the nice up-to-date Enterprise Works logo. But uh, this was promoted, I think, mostly about the PPP, and we'll definitely cover that from new first draw and second draw applications, also covering forgiveness a little bit in case any of you have PPP loans now. But the more part is also, um, there's the EIDL program, Economic Injury Disaster Loan, and uh, SBA Debt Relief. So we'll make sure we touch on all of those. In fact, here's the outline. Um, for everything that we'll sort of touch on, but most most of the time probably will be spent on the uh, on the PPP. So we're off and running. First of all, so here are the the here's what's new about the PPP program that just came out at the end of December. There's another 284 billion dollars in it. There was about 650 billion in the first round, but this uh, program. Uh, is available now and runs through the end of March, um, assuming that, that the, uh, the money lasts that long. But um, it can provide a second PPP loan for those who already had one or first time around if you haven't. Uh, most of the things are the same with the exception that um, if it's a second loan, you'll have to demonstrate a 25% loss of gross receipts sort of year to year, 2019 to 2020, you can pick whichever quarter you wanna use, but uh, they have to be the same quarters for the, uh, the respective years. If you're in the um, you know, food service or accommodation, restaurant, hospitality businesses, you can get three and a half months of average uh, monthly payroll instead of two and a half months. They're trying to target those industries which were especially affected. Um, and there are some additional expenses that are eligible, although it doesn't change the 60% payroll requirement. We'll get to that in a minute. So a lot of PPP expenses, um, including costs for outdoor dining, like, you know, uh, heaters and um, lighting and huts and igloos or whatever you may be using. Um, also supplier costs like inventory and things like that um, are now eligible. A couple of key uh, pieces of information that are uh, very, very important, one of which is important for those who have PPP loans now. Uh, there's a new forgiveness application out if your loan was $150,000 or less, which represents about two thirds, almost 70% of all the PPP loans. And it's a one page uh, form that we have a link to. Um, you will, if you have a PPP loan now, the SBA will no longer deduct your idle uh, advance from last year, which was $1,000 per employee up to $10,000. Uh, they won't deduct that from your uh, forgiveness amount, which is fantastic. 
And also they um, um, negotiated with the IRS and you can now still deduct eligible expenses that you paid for with PPP funds, uh, they're still deductible on your tax return. So some important pieces of information uh, new with this program. A little bit more about the additional eligible expenses. I won't read the whole, uh, the whole slide, but some operations expenditures like software um, and HR and accounting needs, um, things like moving to the cloud. This is an attempt, I think, to sort of support businesses that were having to, having to move more of their business online uh, for a number of reasons. But uh, property damage costs due to civil unrest. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail about this, but it is important that you don't double dip. There are some other programs that are out there uh, where you can try to get some reimbursement for costs uh, due to civil unrest. Um, um, but you got to make sure you're careful about how you access and use the funds. Supplier costs, as I mentioned, which um, could include inventory. Um, if it's perishable inventory, you can uh, make these arrangements before or anytime during the life of this loan. Otherwise, they would like you to have, if it's sort of standing purchase orders and things that were in fact prior to taking out the loan. And then last were the uh, worker and customer uh, PPE, you know, protection um, uh, products. So adaptive investments also include um, the, like the outdoor equipment that you may have need or plexiglass for your sales counter or, or anything like that. So if this is gonna be your first draw loan, in other words, you didn't do it last time, you can select a covered period between eight and 24 weeks. Um, that becomes a little bit more important uh, when you're applying for forgiveness than it is now, but uh, you know, make some sense to sort of stretch it out if you can. Um, and you can be fully forgiven for this loan. So essentially it becomes a grant. If you can maintain your employee, your staff count and your wage levels, in other words, you don't lay anybody off and you don't reduce their compensation. Um, if you spend it um, on eligible expenses, follow the rules. So 60% at least on payroll, everything else on those eligible expenses. So rent, utilities, mortgage interest payments, plus the additional things that they added. And if it's a second draw loan, so if you, if you got a uh, PPP loan before, you may be in the process of trying to get forgiveness for that. Um, you, uh, the only new things really about it are they've changed sort of the small business definition for this program from 500 employees down to 300 employees. And once again, you'll have to demonstrate a 25% reduction in gross receipts between comparable quarters of 2019 and 2020. I've gotten a lot of questions about exactly what gross receipts means and it's top line revenue. You don't really get to deduct anything out of it like cost of goods or anything like that. You can take sales tax out, but that's really it. Um, again, it's two and a half times your average monthly uh, 2019 or 2020 payroll costs. You can look at either year. And of course you want the one that, that's the highest, right? Uh, with a max of 2 million on a second draw loan. And if you're in the accommodation or food services sector, uh, you can get three and a half times your average monthly payroll. There are a few set asides here. I'll, I'll leave them. You can look, them, look at them in more detail on your own. But uh, this program, they really wanted to target uh, businesses that may have had a hard time getting it last time, tough, uh, you know, getting lenders to work with and so forth. So they've set aside specific amounts of money that are gonna go through smaller community-based lenders. And that I think was exclusive through um, Tuesday, if I'm right, uh, 19th. And uh, then uh, also 35 billion of it is specifically for first time PPP borrowers. And then there are some other categories. So 10 employees or less gets a chunk and if their loans of less than $250,000 in low or moderate income 
of areas, there's a set aside for them also. Here are the new loan applications. These are current as of uh, uh, about Tuesday night. So these are the latest and greatest. We won't take a look at them right now, but they're not, they're not very complicated. A little bit about PPP forgiveness. Now this really only applies to you right now if you have a PPP loan and you're trying to work it out, um, a lot of people are done and already applied for forgiveness. And, and um, I uh, hope it was simple and worked out for them, but it's much simpler now. So now there's a new uh, forgiveness application. And the only requirement is that your loan is under $150,000. And as I said, since the uh, average loan was just over 100,000, this covers about two thirds of all the PPP loans. And uh, here's the link to the loan itself. It's got uh, one page for the application. There's a page uh, to provide optional demographic information. And then there are some instructions, but really after your business info and uh, a little bit of information about your loan, they wanna know how many employees were you able to retain because you got this loan uh, how much are you going to spend on payroll and what the total loan amount was, and uh, you'll be done. It's important to point out, though, with all of these forgiveness applications, um, you still need to uh, connect back up with your lender who processed your PPP loan to begin with, uh, because they'll still have to apply for forgiveness on your behalf. And um, they don't even, they're not required to use these forms. So they'll definitely want some more information from you, and they may even have their own portal or form or process that they're going to go through. The two other uh, versions of the forgiveness applications, now remember, these will only apply to you if your loan was over $150,000. So let's assume for these purposes that it is. Uh, the full forgiveness application, which makes you do all the work and include wage and staffing information, et cetera, et cetera, uh, is there. And there's the link. The one that uh, you hopefully may, may be able to use is uh, the EZ application, which again is about a page. And uh, that one may be two pages. But if you're self-employed and don't have any employees or you didn't reduce your uh, staff's hours or the number of employees and didn't reduce anybody's wages by more than 25% or you had reductions in business activity. I think the date is after February 15th or starting February 15th of last year because of health directives that you had to uh, meet, type of business you were in, you know, mitigation measures. Um, and even under those conditions, you didn't reduce anybody's wages by more than 25%. If you can meet any of those three conditions, you can use the easy application and it is much easier. Uh, one thing that's nice that they did with these new applications, and these are all new uh, also as of, uh, I think, Tuesday night, there used to be separate forms with the instructions. Now they've included the instructions right on the same link, so the information's all right there for you. And that's really it. That, that's all that was new to say about the PPP. I'm going to touch on some of these other programs. Um, uh, just a little bit, but the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program is open once again. Um, I've gotten a lot of questions for people that wanted to know about the grant versus the loan. You can't apply for the EIDL grant. We'll talk about it on the next slide, but you have to have applied last year and either gotten some of it, but not all, or not gotten it at all. Uh, so we'll talk about that next. The EIDL loan um, is a good program, low interest, maximum of $150,000. Um, if you're under 300 employees, a lot of not-for-profits are eligible for this also. 3.75% interest rate on a 30-year loan is uh, um, uh, pretty good terms. Here's the link to the portal right here. I checked it again just this morning and it's open. In fact, it, there's a note on it right when you go in that says, this is not where you apply for the grant. You have to do this uh, another way. So this is something that's pretty easy to, um, 
to apply to the uh, the portal. That process doesn't take very long if you just get some basic information together before you apply. Okay, so the idle grant. Um, now it's important that this is only for businesses that previously applied, and you may have gotten some of that ten thousand dollars. You know, a thousand dollars times how many employees you have. Uh, or maybe you didn't get any because the funds were exhausted by the time you applied, right? So that's a qualification. You have to be located in a low income community. And although we're not going to go look, I put a link there uh, to the census data where you can go uh, just put your address in uh, of your business and it'll tell you whether you're in a low income community. And you have to be able to show via, excuse me. Um, you have to be able to show by via comparative eight week periods that you suffer an economic loss of at least 30%. Um, and like with everything else, uh, you can't have more than 300 employees. Now, you said here are all the qualifications. So what do I do? Well, you don't do anything. If you meet these qualifications, the SBA knows you're eligible and they will contact you. They already have all of your information because you applied for the grant. Um, and or the, the loan last time. Um, so it's important to point out a couple of things. The idle grants are not taxable. By the way, if you didn't know this, I didn't put it in the PPP, but it's also remained the forgivable portion of your PPP loan is also not taxable as income. Um, like with the PPP, you're not going to be um, um, denied a tax deduction for eligible expenses that you paid for with these funds. And it also will not be deducted from your uh, PPP loan forgiveness amount. So all those things sort of uh, follow from one program to the next. But it's really important just right now, I wanted to give you this information, but if you didn't apply before, there's nothing you can do. And if you did apply before, the SBA will contact you. A little bit more about some of the, the lesser well-known programs, but I'll keep this really short. Grants for shuttered venue operators. These are venues that uh, uh, offer entertainment. So the biggest single question I've gotten is, well, what about you know wedding venues? Now, you know, just event venues, meeting places don't qualify. It needs to be a live venue, so music, um, film performing arts of some kind um, or talent representatives um, uh, who work with them. And you have to be able to show at least a 25% reduction in revenue. Now the first uh, month of this program, if for the first 14 days, uh, only organizations that suffered at least 90% loss are eligible. The next 14 days, it's 70% loss. And after that, it opens up for everybody else. Um, they do have a $2 billion sort of allotment for um, uh, venues that have uh, not no more than 50 full-time employees and uh, eligible expenses are similar to the others. Uh, then there are a few other organizational types. I didn't provide all the details that I uh, uh, did in the other webinar because I don't know if these apply to any of you folks, but News organizations like, you know, newspaper, radio, et cetera, or, you know, you have an FCC license. The main um, uh, restrictions for this is that you have to show that you're going to use the funds for like local or emergency content, right? It's not just general use of funds. Uh, then 501c6s, which are now eligible, they weren't eligible before. And uh, so this can be chambers of commerce, economic development corporations would be a couple of examples, uh, at least around here. Um, and destination marketing organizations. So tourism councils, things like that. In both of those cases, one of the important things, and this holds true for most sort of SBA funding, is you can't have too much lobbying activity. So you can't get more than 15% of your revenue from uh, via lobbying and no more than 15% of your activities as an organization can be directed at lobbying. And then the la last but not least, 
and this could be very interesting to some of you, the SBA debt relief program was reinstated. Now this involves the uh, 7A and 504 programs and 7A includes the community advantage and uh, microloan programs. And so if you, if you have one of these loans now, the SBA is gonna pretty automatically give you an additional three months of uh, loan payments. If you had it last year, you may have already experienced this and gotten six months of loan payments. But uh, according to the SBA, either they or your SBA lender who uh, uh, process this loan for you will just let you know that it's done. There isn't really anything that you have to do about it. Um, so additional three months of payment assistance with a $9,000 per month max. Um, if you are uh, able to and want to apply for one of these loans, starting on February 1st, you'll get six months of payments made uh, for you, also capped at $9,000 a month. And there's one more sort of tweak to this. The additional subsidies, so if you have a loan and you get that three months of payments, if you're considered underserved, and we'll talk about what that means in a minute, you'll get an additional five months of payments at the same $9,000 a month cap. So what does it mean to be underserved? Well, if you have a micro loan or a community advantage loan, you're eligible. And if you have a 7A or a 504 loan in the, any of these industries listed below, then you're eligible. They're kind of, they're focused on, you know, hospitality, entertainment, recreation, education, et cetera. And you can look up your industry code uh, in that list right there. And um, um, if you fall into one of those categories, you're eligible to get another five months of uh, SBA loan payments, which is fantastic. There are a few more details with the 504 program. Um, I won't go into them now, but we have uh, more info if you're interested. And with that, I think that's it. Here's my contact information. I encourage you to send me an email. I get emails after webinars uh, frequently. We've included Marielle Wasanga's uh, contact info as well. She's the director of our International Trade Center. Um, and mo most importantly, in this context, she's also fluent in Spanish, French, Italian, Portuguese, and Mandarin. If you would uh, rather talk to somebody in a, another native language. Um, and then always we put our um, uh, website down there. Um, it's good if you're not a client and you would like to be, it's always free to work with us and confidential. Um, you can find the button that says become a client, fill out a short form and you'll be ready to work with us. You can take advantage of all the resources you have at Enterprise Works and um, take advantage of us as well. Also, our, we have a tab on the home page of events, and you can see the schedule for all these various webinars that we're doing, and we are doing quite a few. In addition to this one, which was kind of customized for you, there's one you know, that has a little bit more detail on the Economic Aid Act. There's one that's focused specifically on PPP forgiveness, and there's another one that covers the entire range of resources, you know, financial resources available at the federal and state and private um, levels, local when we get some back. Um, so I encourage you to check those out and uh, would welcome you to attend anytime you want. And with that, we're done and it's time for questions. Thanks, Don. Um, we have a, a small group. So if you are comfortable, you can either you know throw a question in the chat, but more so if you wanna pop your video on it or your sound on and ask, you're more than welcome to do so. Okay, do we have to unmute him, Kathy? Or uh, excuse me, Kathy. Hi, Kathy, uh, Laura. Um, I think they can unmute themselves. Can mute themselves. Because, okay. Yeah. Um, I'll just ask a question and I just wanted to make sure I heard you correct on the idle loan. So the only people who are eligible for those are people who previously applied and didn't get them or got under the amount of money? Well, not for the loan, Laura, for the grant, the advance. The grant. So the, the idle loan is open just the same as it was before. The only restriction would be is you can't, 
get a second one if you already have one from last year. But no, the uh, what I was talking about was specifically the grant. So if you applied last year and you got somewhere between one but not $10,000, you're eligible maybe to get the remainder of that $10,000, but you also have to be in a low income community and you also have to be able to show that you uh, uh, suffered that, that revenue loss. Now the low income community, as I said, the SBA will tell you, but that's why I gave that link. You could look at your census track and you would be surprised. For instance, uh, you know, downtown Champaign qualifies. So, so if you go, if you, so if you hadn't, let's say you did not apply for that before, how do you qualify again? You don't. There, there is no way to apply for the idle grant now. Okay, that's, that was, okay, got it. Okay. Roger, you have a question? Uh, yeah, hi, hi Don. Um, I know last summer we were discussing that uh, they were questioning whether the, all the expenses were IRS um, deductible. It, it sounds like you said that they, they are. Um, I just wanted to kind of double check that. And uh, I mean, that's a great deal if that's the case. You don't have to pay taxes on the loan and you still get to de deduct those ex eligible expenses. So is that, have I got that correct? Cause it doesn't seem like that should be right, but. Well, and they, and apparently the SBA and IRS discussed this for a while, but uh, yeah, as the new legislation in the economic aid act, it said if they're uh, now, of course they have to be eligible expenses, right? So if you, for instance, you spent money through the PPP loan or with the idle um, uh, grant that was not an eligible expense, you're kind of out, out of bounds anyway. But if it was an eligible expense, you could still deduct it. And previously that was not the case. The IRS thought that was kind of kind of a double dipping situation, but uh, no more. So right. yeah, Thank that is great. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the clarification on that. I think that's important. For the sake of, I think our audience, the the one of the reasons we focus on PPP is just we thought that that was probably what most of them would qualify in, in the case of the second draw. Um, I don't know if you address this, but um, do you have to have applied for forgiveness for the if you were a first draw before you can get the second draw? No, it just the wording I could go back and find it, but it said you either must have used all your funds or plan to use all your funds. Well, the thing is, is one way or another, if you got the PPP loan last year, the end of your covered period was December 31st, if not earlier, because that was the deadline for the program, right? So you should have spent all your money last year. You don't have to have applied for forgiveness yet. You have 10 months from the end of the covered period to apply for forgiveness. And then if you don't, what happens is your PPP loan just converts to a loan. You don't get any of it forgiven. And um, uh, you, can, you can bet probably that, especially for the, the smaller it is, the more likely your lender is probably going to be in touch with you saying, hey, let's please resolve this situation. They frankly don't, you know, they don't want a small loan that's, you know, five years at 1% really either. So, uh, but you have 10 months. That's the, that's the timeline. Hi, Don. This is Catherine uh, from Adatech. I have, Hi, yeah, I have one question regarding this eligible payroll for the PPP loan, because I applied the second PPP yesterday, okay. and it looks to me that the, the in order to be eligible, or the, the a loan can be forgivable. Does that I have to pay the employee? who are permanent resident in US. The question is, because in our payroll, we have some student, international student, who do not need to pay the, the social security or benefit. It looks to me, or it sounds to me, I cannot pay using the PPP to pay for those employee. Okay. Am I correct? Or that's kind of like, I don't know. I'm a little bit confused. Okay. 
on your and 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 I'm not that familiar with this. You you probably know it maybe um, Laura in Enterprise Works or if you're more used to working with international um, you know interns or workers. Um, I think sort of the first requirement would be you know they would have to be a W two employee. Yeah, that's uh, awesome. on your payroll. Yeah, um, and and if they're not they're more likely to fall into like a contractor category or something. And in a lot of cases, and I don't know, again, with the students and what kind of work visas they're working from, uh, they may not be able to apply on their own as, you know, independent contractors, but, you know, that's a whole other category of people that can apply. And I get that question a lot from, you know, business owners that say, I don't have employees, I use contractors. Well, you can't use what you pay them in calculating your average payroll, but they can apply on their own. So I don't, I don't know where your, um, um, where your particular sort of student employees fall. Um, you know, that would be kind of a um, HR specialist question, or I don't know, maybe Roger, do you know anything about that? How's your uh, payroll expertise? Uh, well, it's uh, we the university has an HR department. We might be able to get something answered for you on that. If, uh, That's a really good question, Catherine. I've never had anybody answer that question before because it's usually just, you know, if they're employees on your payroll, you count them and use them. But in your case, it's not quite that simple. Yeah, no, and, and if it's a contractor, you're right. It would be it counted for separately through them. Right. But the reason about why asking this question, when I applied the first time, there is no such called kind of instruction or requirement. But in the second one, they have very specific like kind of requirement where you get your like uh, payroll calculated from your form 940 or 941. That's why I look at it, their instruction as oh. I don't know that in that scenario. So that's okay. Yeah. Okay. We told you if you, someone at the university can help us to find the answer, I'm glad to know the, the what is the best solution. Because we okay. have some international students. They are working on, I think, this some OPT student status who have eligible working in the United States. The only difference between them and the people who are working on the uh, working visa or like a uh, US citizens, the only difference is they do not pay that social security tax. That's the only difference. I, I still need to issue them the W-2, but just based on the requirement based on the website, I'm a little bit confused. I don't okay. know whether I can cover them using this PVP or not. Okay. Okay. Well, I think that sort of the larger issue is figuring out what their status is, but even because even though their payroll tax situation is different, that doesn't really make any difference in terms of money changing hands with this program because the program doesn't allow you to pay their payroll tax. You can't include their payroll taxes in your payroll amount anyway. Yeah, I agree. Oh. I completely agree because okay. I applied this second PVP through Chase yesterday. Uh -huh. They have like a question list you, ha you have to mark. In this time, they still have a question for me. Does all you employee have permanent residency within the United States? Oh, okay. That's on the first time I have, there's no such question. Okay, yeah, I don't remember that one from the first one either. And that may just be something that the SBA has decided that that if you don't have at least permanent resident status, you know, they're not going to let you include them, but that yeah, would be new, yeah, you're and, right. And, and then my understanding based on that question, if you are student, they have some requirement, they do not qualify as residency because when we call residency they, it's the tax residency it's not like the 
legal right. immigration status. Yeah. Right. Well, I have somebody I can uh, send an email to about this. Somebody in the SBA that uh, is sort of my uh, my chief question answerer, and see if I can get an answer for you. And we've talked before, so I'm pretty sure I have your email address already, don't I? I think yes, so. we talked before. You have my sure. Email. So, okay. Thank you. Hey, Catherine, did you say they are OPT eligible? Is that what the, the classification was? Oh, what do you mean? So the they're, they're o, o, OPT under the OPT CPT program? Yeah. Yes, some of students are working under both, have situation both under CPT and OPT. But okay. I think they have a status as students within five years. They they can, they do not have this kind of tax status. Yeah, I may not using the, the correct word, but that is situation. And my understanding is somehow they execute those people from the PPP. At least that's my understanding from the requirement. Okay, I can I can do some research in the text of the legislation and also ask somebody at the SBA. Okay, that would be clarify nice. that. Yeah. Well, one thing I would be interested in is do they do they meet the requirements? So are they on your payroll as W two employees, or yeah. they're, they're some other? There's something else, right? They, they, that that's my con, like confusing point because they are on my W two payroll status. Okay. The only thing different, I think, is their, I mean, tax purpose residency status. Okay. Okay. We'll look into that. Okay. Do you have any other questions? Yeah. So are we, uh, are we allowed to take more than our original draw one uh, during draw two, even if we, you know, specifically claim and uh, that we had a at least one quarter on quarter decline in revenue of at least 25%. Um, yeah, I don't see why not. And, and the uh, one example of that that I could see would be, you know, you use 2019 payroll data to determine your amount the first time around. And this time around, I think you can also, you can choose 2019 or 2020 data. Right. You know, they didn't want to penalize you if you had a really bad 2020, but let's say it was different. You hired more people than you yeah. had in 2019 and your payroll's higher. You, you can do that. Yeah, I don't think there's any any reason why your 2020 or your second draw can't be more than your first draw. I haven't seen anything like that. Okay. Yeah, I, that's what I was also my read. I It just seems surprising that they were allowing you to do that. So. Uh. I'm sorry, Don. I I just uh, joined. I missed it. So, no, is there any difference? Any difference between the application of the first round and the second round? Difference in applications? Yeah, there are two different applications. They're on. You'll get the slide deck, and whether it's first draw or second draw, there are two different applications. Uh, yeah, but I mean, is there is different requirements for the applications? Because what I read so far is that's almost. Uh, the same kind of materials that we're going to be providing is that true um mostly let's see we have to go let me go back and see if i can find yeah. one that very easily outlines the differences yeah i, I don't want to bother you i mean if you no, no, no. I, I, I think yeah. probably the big one the big two uh -huh. that are different is that um for, for your second draw loan that's when you have to show that 25% loss of gross receipts. I don't think if it's your first draw alone that you have to do that. Right. Um, and then the other one is if you're in restaurant and hospitality businesses, which I don't think anybody on this Zoom are, you get an extra month of um, payroll. You okay. get three and a half months instead of two and a half months. Um, other than that, I don't, um, you know, I could be missing a detail here or there, but I don't think there's much that's different. So maybe all, all what we need is to submit uh, uh, like the, the income for 2019 and 2020 in order to quantify the 25% uh, loss. Well, loss. what you do is you pick a quarter. 
Oh, just you in can, one you quarter. Can any quarter you want, but you got to use the same quarter from each year. And of course, what you want to do is you want to pick the quarter that shows the greatest, you know, and make sure you hit 25%. I just talked with a client um, a couple of days ago, and they were kind of struggling to find one, which is why the questions ended up about how do I define gross receipts? And, um, but yeah, you want to look at the quarter that's going to for sure confirm that you had at least a 25% revenue loss. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Yep. Is, is, is there is a, a presentation deck that you're going to share with us? I think we're going to send it. Uh, okay, we'll we'll send the recording and the slide deck out to you. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Yep. Just to confirm what Don said, we will send out the recording and the slide deck. And um, as we mentioned, in case you weren't here earlier, that Don does these webinars um, uh, on the regular. And if you want some specific time with him as well, he's uh, happy to work with folks. And if you don't mind dropping um, Don's email on the chat, that would be great. Um, and before we leave, so if uh, All right. everyone can have it, and I think it's in the, it's we'll make sure to put it in the information that we send out again. Well, it's it's so. on the last, uh, the last slide of the slide deck too. Okay, great, Excellent. great. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, hope you can enjoy some sunshine today, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Don. Thanks, everyone. Don. <laughs> All right, there you go. Give you my email address one more time. Uh, thanks everybody. Yeah, please feel free to contact me if you have questions.